morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce Noelle Leconte, uh, one of our own. Um, she took her bachelor's degree with distinction in honors in uh, biology at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and then was an AOA graduate of the University of Illinois in Chicago before she took her internship here at the University of Wisconsin. She then went on to OHSU in Portland to complete her residency before coming back to Wisconsin for a medical oncology fellowship and geriatrics fellowship. She joined the faculty as an assistant professor in 2006 and in 2014 uh, was promoted to associate professor CHS. Her other roles include she's the leader for outreach for the cancer center uh, for cancer control and population science division of the cancer center. She's co-leader of the GI oncology disease oriented re working group and she's chair of the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee for the Carbone Cancer Center, a 20% uh, federally funded uh, position. She's published broadly uh, with 42 uh, publications in peer review uh, journals, three invited reviews and editorials, and four book chapters. She's received over the years and currently receives funding from NIH, ECOG, the Cancer Center, the National Cancer Prevention and Control Program, and as well as foundation grants. Um, her service is, has been longstanding both locally and nationally. Um, she's served as a study section reviewer now for the NIH uh, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, uh, reviewing projects for colorectal cancer or pancreas uh, cancer focus. Um, locally, she serves as a, uh, she served as a voting member of the IRB and currently is chair of the uh, Cancer Center Data S Safety and Monitoring Committee. Nationally, she's very active. She reviews for 11 different journals, um, has a number of positions over the years in the major oncology organizations, including she's a, a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology Prevention Committee. She's the chair of the Alcohol Policy Work Group for the American Society of Clinical Oncology and she's currently a member of the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network's Treatment Guidelines Committee for Pancreatic Adenocarcinoma. Uh, Dr. Locante is also a, an avid educator at all levels, students, residents, fellows, as well as CME. She's given a number of national talks, and we're really fortunate to have her present um, her perspective here today uh, in grand rounds entitled Colorectal Cancer Screening, can we improve care to Milwaukee's poorest citizens? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lacante. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Nice to see many friendly faces in the audience. Um, Dr. Page uh, gave you the title of my talk, which is I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about colorectal cancer in general and specifically in Milwaukee and some work we're doing to improve colorectal cancer screening rates in our state. So I would hope that at the end of this talk you would be able to, have to achieve these two obje objectives which are to discuss the racial disparity in colorectal cancer incidence and outcome and then also to recall some of our public health efforts to improve colorectal cancer screening rates at federally qualified health centers in Milwaukee. So I thought before I dove into the project, I would tell you a little bit about Comprehensive Cancer Control, which is the program that I'm the PI for here in our state that I figured many of you don't know about. Comprehensive Cancer Control is a designated um, title from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, it's a collaborative uh, and strategic approach to bring partners together to address the burden of cancer in an area, specifically states, territories, and Indian um, communities, tribes, and tribal organizations. Every state has a comprehensive cancer control program. Most are housed at the Department of Public Health. Here in Wisconsin, it's housed at the UW. We're one of only two states, and we were the first state where it was housed at, the, at an academic center rather than um, at the State Department of Public Health. So in, specifically in our state, this is our program and how we envision it. We think of it as three components that have some overlap, those three components being a partnership, a program, and a plan. I'll start with the plan, and I did bring some copies of these. If this piques your interest at all, please come up and see me after the talk. I'd love to give this out. But every five years, we write 
um, with all of our partners a five-year plan, uh, which is kind of our um, plan for how we're going to address controlling cancer in our state over the next five years. It's a framework for us to use. The program then, which is what I'm the PI of, is our state's cancer prevention and control program that facilitates the development, implementation, and evaluation of the plan. However, we are not the sole utilizers of this plan, right? All of our partners, and there's about 100 groups that participate, use this plan to help them. And then the partnership is the coalition of organizations that's dedicated to the development, implementation, and evaluation of the plan, and that's specifically called the Wisconsin Cancer Council. That was started by the American Cancer Society and um, Paul Carbone. And we have one of the longest standing cancer coalitions in Wisconsin. It much predated the Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. We do have a website, which is wicancer.org as well. And welcome. You can come and look. The plan is all in there. It's, you can um, put in what your role is, and it'll give you suggestions for how to use all of our goals and strategies. So these are the program staff. Um, so together we use this plan to coordinate and implement our cancer control efforts, uh, promote and um, the implementation of the plan amongst our partners, and then facilitate and staff the, the cancer council. So this is who received the funding for the program I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. So now a little bit about colorectal cancer. So my group did these infographics around multiple different cancers. This is the infographic we created around colorectal cancer. Again, wicancer.org. You can download it for any use that you have. Um, so the, the two statistics I like to bring to your attention is that in Wisconsin, seven people hear every day that they have colorectal cancer. And that also one in four of Adults between the ages of 50 and 75 are not being screened in Wisconsin currently. And you can see we have some strategies outlined at the bottom for how we as a community could improve our colorectal cancer rates and outcomes, including advocating for full coverage of colonoscopy, improving access to healthy diet, reducing smoking use. So colon cancer is the second most common cancer across the United States and also in Wisconsin. Um, in the United States, there's 134,490 new cases per year estimated for 2016, with just over 49,000 deaths annually. It is 8% of all cancer deaths. Screening is recommended to start at between 45 and 50, and I'll go through why there's that variation in a little bit. And there are multiple approved screening tests. I, I just pulled the American Cancer Society guidelines, but obviously the U.S. Um, Preventive Services Task Force has guidelines as well. American Cancer Society recommends any of the following, flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, colonoscopy every 10 years, double contrast barium enema every five years, virtual colonoscopy every five years, guaiac fecal occult blood testing yearly, fecal immunochemical testing yearly, or stool DNA testing every three years. I would like to focus a little bit on the FIT or um, the FIT testing, or some people call it the IFOBT. That's a test that uses antibodies to detect blood in the stool. Um, it doesn't require any drug or diet modifications, unlike the guaiac testing. It is done annually, usually multiple cards, three is recommended, but even one has a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. And for reasons that I will go into later, I think this is an ideal test for a high poverty patient population. So colorectal cancer, Risk factors, I figured we should just review this so we're on the same page. So men have a slight increase over women. It's a disease of uh, age, so as we get older, our risk goes up. There's a clear association with what's called low socioeconomic status and black race. And just a comment on why I choose the word black over African American. Um, there's a, I would not normally recommend a BuzzFeed video during Grand Rounds. However, there is a wonderful BuzzFeed video about why people prefer to be called black versus African American. Basically, not everyone who identifies as black is necessarily from Africa, Caribbean, etc. cetera. Um, and so black is generally a favored term. However, I may slip and use them interchangeably because for many years I use the term African American. Um, so I'm going to really dig deep into why it, there's higher rates in blacks in a bit. Physical inactivity, it's controversial, but some people think poor quality diet defined as high red meat, low fiber, low fruits and veggies. Smoking, obesity, alcohol, interestingly, um, only is associated with increased risk in men, not women. 
And then there are, of course, the hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes like Lynch syndrome, FAP, and then inflammatory bowel disease is a known risk factor. So that's the background. So let's look at cancer incidence. These figures um, look at um, this, the incidence rates in various cancers by race, race as self-defined um, in this data. The black line corresponds to the white population, and then the lighter line corresponds to the black population, which nobody talked to me when they designed these figures. I would have told them that makes no sense whatsoever. However, <laughs> what you can see is that cancer incidence in general, and we know this across most cancers, is going down. Even in lung cancer, finally, we've sort of hit the peak and we're starting to come down. But what you can also see is that the black population is not seeing the same rate of benefit across some cancers. Now, in colorectal, it looks pretty similar, actually, when you look on a national scale. And that's the, the one in the upper left corner there. However, I did some work where we pulled the, cancer, the statewide cancer registry data and looked at incidence data for African Americans, or I'm sorry, blacks and whites. And what you can see is that the black numbers are pretty stagnant. They're not seeing any decrease, and then the white population is going down. So at least in Wisconsin, that disparity is actually widening, not lessening. And I did use the black shading for the black population and the light shading for the <laughs> white population. So flipping back to the darker bar being the white population here, looking at stages, what else do we know about blacks? Well, they're diagnosed at a later stage, or they're more likely to have unstage cancer, which is generally metastatic cancer. Um, so you can see that in the upper left corner again. In colorectal, whites have higher rates of localized or regional, which is defined as nodal disease. Blacks have higher rates of unstage or metastatic disease. And that's true across multiple cancer types, but not all cancer types. For example, lung cancer is pretty consistent between the two. So I've shown you some data that says the incidence um, is higher in African Americans in Wisconsin, and the disparity is widening that blacks have a later stage of diagnosis and they have higher mortality. This corresponds to a 20% higher colorectal cancer mortality across the U.S. So why is that? You know, I've, I've learned that as a fellow very early, but only recently have I really tried to dig into the data. And I'm here to tell you today that it's not a biological predisposition. It's largely um, a social and care delivery issue. The good news there is that that's a fixable problem. The bad news there is that it's a big problem and it's gonna require big thinkers to fix. So we think that 50% of the disparity between blacks and whites in colorectal cancer is related solely to the utilization of colorectal cancer screening. That is abundantly fixable. The remaining 50% we think broadly um, groups into three different areas. One is a general lack of awareness of colorectal cancer as a risk on the part of the patient. So maybe if you didn't have a family history of colon cancer, you don't think that you yourself are at high risk, whereas everyone who's 50 or above should really perceive themselves as being at risk for colon cancer. There is some cultural uh, lack of acceptance around colorectal cancer screening modalities. So doing stool cards, having colonoscopy is not always palatable to people. I wrote discrimination when I first prepared these slides, but I think a better term for the next one is actually bias. I, I really don't believe that there's very many providers who are saying, you know, I'm gonna screen my black patients at lower rates than my white patients. But I do think there's unknown or um, implicit bias present in all of us um, that affects how we make recommendations to our patients. And then thirdly, and probably the most important area is poverty. Um, Poverty is a complex issue that affects health in multiple ways. I just pulled out several here that, that I think are important. One is access to um, quality and stable housing, access to health care and insurance, um, both physical proximity to a health care facility, but also access to covered insurance uh, or covered health care procedures, testing, doctors, etc. Food quality is an interesting concept. Um, there's this um, thing called a food desert, which is an urban area where it's difficult to find affordable or good quality food. And this directly correlates to lack of grocery stores, farmers markets, and healthy food providers within urban, usually poor communities. 
Um, and then if you look at the map of fast food and convenience stores, it basically maps right over these food deserts. So people are having to make choices about the kind of food that they can get, and they can't even, even if they wanted to eat five to six fruits or veggies a day, they may not have easy access to it. It may involve multiple bus lines or having to get a car from somebody, etc. There is a food desert locator that I found, part of the First Lady's Let's Move initiative, which is super interesting. If you ever have 15 minutes to kill, you punch in your zip code and it'll tell you how many food deserts are around you. Income, and I'm going to go into that in more detail, but lower income obviously corresponds to poor health. Higher crime rates, lower performing schools, and lower educational attainment amongst poorer populations. And then the chronic stress of living in a poor environment elevates um, stress hormones in our body that may be part of um, cancer formation. So I put my most important point in the box there, and if you take nothing else away from this talk, this is what I would want you to take away, which is the data supporting a true biological predisposition for colorectal cancer is weak or non-existent. I wanted to use this uh, as an opportunity to plug the Go Big Read this, for this year. The Go Big Read is a program selected, a book selected by our chancellor. Um, the author comes and speaks to us every year. This author came uh, last month. This year, uh, Chancellor Blank chose um, this book called Evicted, which is fabulous. And you should absolutely put it on your Christmas list. It's, it's totally worth your time. Um, the author is Matthew Desmond, and he is an uh, American sociologist. Um, he's an associate professor at Harvard, and he received his PhD here at UW. And this book is about giving voice to the experiences of families in Milwaukee whose lives have been impacted by an increasing, increasingly unstable and untenable housing situation in Milwaukee, specifically around evictions, and it follows eight families. And um, I tweeted yesterday that I was going to be giving this talk, and Matthew Desmond retweeted my tweet, so I'm super, super <laughs> excited. I'm kind of a big deal because Matthew Desmond retweeted me, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's fabulous. We have a website, like, just... And you can, at least at Ebling, they were giving away free copies. I have a copy. If anyone wants it, I'll lend it to you for free. So take the time and read it. It's a wonderful book. So this slide is to drive home the point that poverty begets poverty. So children born in poverty likely become adults in poverty. Adults who are poor have worse health outcomes. People, adults who are sick, are more likely to be poor. This is data from UNICEF from 2014. Um, the title of the report was called Child Well-Being in Rich Countries. And you can see that the United States is second to the bottom on this figure, meaning we have the second highest rate of child poverty, slightly beating out Romania. Um, this corresponds to 20% of our children in the United States are poor. However, it's not equally shared amongst all racial groups. So whites, 12% of our children are poor, but 34% of Native American children are poor, 13% of Asian or Pacific Islander children are poor, 36% of black children are poor, 31% of Hispanic or Latino um, children are poor, and then 21% of mixed race children. So you can see that, in particular, blacks bear a larger burden of the poverty. In 2014, the United States had 46.7 million people, or 14.8% of our population, in poverty. This is compounded by a racial income gap, which has been extremely persistent and difficult to address. I just pulled the last 15 years of data here. This is from the U.S. Census Bureau report, 2000 to 2014 data. The, to orient you, the gray bars are areas where we had economic recessions. And then the solid line is the, um, was a model that they used to predict income, and then the dotted line is the actual income data that they had. What you can see is that blacks have persistently the lowest income of any group, and the disparity between blacks and whites corresponds to an eight-year lower life expectancy. Just pause on that for a minute. If you're born black in this country, you have an eight-year lower life expectancy. It's not okay. Um, if we look at home ownership as a surrogate for wealth uh, or savings, based on the Pew Research Foundation, blacks la lag behind every group. Even if we only look at people who've achieved at least bachelor's degree education. So this is not all just education. In 2013, the median white household wealth was $144,000, and in blacks it was $11,000. So 
So as I was preparing this talk, I kept coming back to this editorial that I had read, oh, I don't know, two years ago, in the American Journal of Public Health, which is a big public health journal. And I kept coming back to it because it, it really spoke to me about how, as health experts, we need to really be taking on racism and, and racial um, disparities as a key uh, area of improvement for our, for our work. So what I've shown you thus far is that the U.S. has high rates of childhood poverty, that non-whites bear that burden more than whites, that there is a, a high and persistent income and wealth disparity in our country, and that disparities in income housing and food create disparities in health. So let me walk you through what this editorial, the, the basic core take-home points of it are. It's very short. It's only two pages. I would encourage you to read it. So the points of this editorial are that racism is a social condition which causes illness, and that race is not the same thing as racism. Most of us in public health conceive of race as a true social construct, not biologically based. Racism, however, is a social system that reinforces racial group inequities. And racism, although it can be individual, right, one person against another person, the racism that we're concerned about as health experts is structural. And so some examples of that would be police violence, mass incarceration, criminalization of uh, you know, low-grade drug use, residential segregation, like the eviction story, and then the digital divide. The digital divide, which I'll come back to later, is the gulf between those who have ready access to computers and internet and those who do not. It's largely explained by educational attainment and income, which again, educational attainment and income also track back to race. And it affects not just general knowledge and access to information, but ability to, to get jobs and produce content on the internet, which is a growing area of occupation for many Americans that a large portion of our population cannot tap into. So this is the call to action from that editorial. And this is my call to action to you as healthcare researchers and experts. The, the most important point is that we put racism on the agenda that we name racism as a force determining social determinants of health and that we strongly say as healthcare providers and health experts that we're not okay with this. Um, most of us have looked at racial and ethnic background in, in our work, whether it's clinical trials, epidemiology, clinical care, quality improvement. Um, and we talked about the disparity, but we need to dig a little bit deeper and say why. Why does that disparity exist? How can we make it go away if it's not truly based in biology? This is not just an issue for so-called disparities where research, researchers, it's really an issue for all of us. The other call to action that they said is always ask yourself, how is racism operating in this question that I'm asking? And then to organize and strategize around ways to improve that. Okay, that was the heavy part. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm through that. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing to, to change this, to make this better. So the, the first take home point is that uh, we've known about this disparity for some time, and it does affect screening recommendations. Specifically, there are two GI groups that recommend that we start screening African Amer blacks at a younger age, 45 years old. It is a grade 2C recommendation. So with that background, I'm going to tell you about the work that we do. If 50% of the disparity in incidence and outcome is related to lack of screening, how can we make that better? So this is a schema about the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. It was started by the American Cancer Society and the Center for Disease Control in 1997. It's a national coalition. UW Health is one of the coalition members. Jen Weiss is our liaison to this group. The, this is the group that set the national goal to screen 80% of eligible adults by 2018. And if we can achieve that goal, uh, 277,000 cases and 203,000 cancer deaths would be prevented by 2030. That's a lot. And this, I'm sorry I did not put the references um, from Cancer in 2015 by Meester. So, so as we were getting involved in the Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, I had done a small pilot project funded through the, U, the Wisconsin Partnership Program here at UW, so internal funding, to work with a single federally qualified health center, and I will go through what FQHCs are in a second, but I worked with a single um, FQHC called Westside, now called Milwaukee Health Services. Um, to help them improve their colorectal cancer screening rates. And that project was successful. We took them from a pretty modest screening rate and roughly doubled it in about a two-year intervention. 
So based on that pilot data, we then applied for the Center of Disease Control five-year grant, which we just received in 2015, $2.5 million grant over five years for which I'm the PI. And this is called the Wisconsin Collaborative Approach to Increase Colorectal Cancer Screening. Um, I was a little bit um, nervous about presenting it because it's very simple work, right? But it's also beautiful in its simplicity. We don't need fancy new tests. We don't need expensive diagnostics. This is really about getting what we know is effective out to the populations that need it. So the grantee is our comp cancer control program here through the Carbone Cancer Center. One of our key collaborators is the Center for Urban Population Health, and I wanted to make sure you were aware of this as a resource. This was established in 2001 as a partnership between UW Aurora and UW Milwaukee to conduct and facilitate original public health research and education that will improve urban communities, and they're based in Milwaukee. They're wonderful. These are the grantees. We're, um, the yellow circles represent um, academic institutions. We were part of phase two of the grant rollout. Our project timeline, we just started in October of 2015. Um, so our first step was to obtain baseline screening data. We actually did not have a good sense of how were these FQHCs doing. And then we worked with each clinic to design a colorectal cancer screening plan and an implementation plan. Um, and we actually started that implementation in May um, of this year. For this coming year, we're going to continue to do implementations, but we're now going to do patient surveys in addition to continuing education um, presentations to both physicians, nurses, medical assistants within these clinics. And then we're continuing to evaluate these evidence-based interventions that these clinics have selected. So uh, public health is nothing if not a team sport. So uh, there's a lot of us that are working on this project. I wanted to specifically point out Allison Antoine, who's our project coordinator, and she's really responsible for the day-to-day -day work of working with these federally qualified health centers, providing technical assistance and what we call emotional support as they go through this sometimes challenging and frustrating work. This was taken um, right shortly after we received the grant. We went and met with the CEOs of the federally qualified health centers in Milwaukee. CEOs Against Cancer is a larger American Cancer Society initiative to get business leaders interested in cancer prevention. But you can see here there's a wide variety of people that were present, and then we actually had a proclamation that day that named that day Colorectal Cancer Screening Day in Milwaukee. So that was a nice kickoff. Our target population for, my, for this project is any adult age 50 to 75 years who gets their primary care, so their medical home is one of these federally qualified health centers, and they are felt to be at average risk for colorectal cancer. There are seven partner health systems. Some have multiple clinics. That's what the number in parentheses is. So, and each clinic has, or each health system has a slightly different demographic bend that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. All but the Walker's Point um, Clinic are federally qualified health centers who report their colorectal screening rates to the federal government utilizing this UDS measure. Walker's Point is a free community clinic that uses uh, that is part of the Aurora system, and they report to, the, to um, the WCHQ, and I'll show you those data too. So that's a state-based recording reporting system. Um, so Kenosha, starting at the top, is largely uh, a clinic for poor white patients. Outreach Community Health Center is a clinic for homeless people. The Milwaukee Health Services is for blacks largely serves blacks. The 16th Street Community Health Centers is for Latinos. Progressive Community Health Center largely serves blacks. Walker's Point is for homeless, and then Gerald Ignace is a Native American clinic population. So to show you that in the map, um, I'm delighted to tell you that we have gotten every single federally qualified health center within the physical borders of Milwaukee on board with this project, and then we also included Kenosha and uh, Waukesha, which are slightly outside of Milwaukee. So what are the FQHCs? Many of us may not know exactly what that population is. These are clinics that were started by Medicare in 1991 under the Public Health Service Act. Um, they're also sometimes called community health centers, but you can be a community health center and not be a federally qualified health center, so they are slightly different. Typically, these are all outpatient clinics. Uh, they can include, as I said, community health centers, but also migrant health centers, homeless health care clinics, public housing, primary care, tribal facilities. And the main purpose, according to CMS, is to enhance provision and primary care services in medically underserved urban and rural environments. 
There are currently 1,200 FQHCs across our country. There are 9,000 communities which are served and 23 million patients. 71% of the patients served at FQHCs are at or below the poverty level. 38% are uninsured, 26% are Medicaid, and it's a roughly 50-50 split urban-rural. These are the broad specific aims for my project, which are to increase partnerships specifically in Milwaukee that support improved access to colorectal cancer screening, improve organizational policies and system changes that uh, emphasize or support evidence-based interventions to improve colorectal cancer screening, and to therefore increase uh, the rates of high quality, meaning recommended colorectal cancer screening rates, through both improving provider knowledge and patient knowledge. This is the um, logic model for our project, and you don't need to read every box, but basically we have short-term goals and then long-term goals. Our long-term goals are basically as simple as to improve colorectal cancer screening rates in Milwaukee, and, decrease, and in doing so, decreasing disparities in colorectal cancer incidence and mortality. The four boxes along the side are the strategies we use to get there, and I'm gonna drill down in the next few slides for you on that. So basically what we're asking people clinics to do is to meet and decide on a panel of what are, we're calling EBBIs, or evidence-based interventions, to improve colorectal cancer screening. These EBBIs are defined by the Center for Disease Control. I did not pick them individually. So each clinic has to pick one of the four at the top, or they could pick all four, at least one, and then any of the supporting strategies below. So let me walk you through each of their choices. So the four EBBIs uh, include provider assessment and feedback, provider reminders, patient reminders, and reducing barriers. So starting with provider assessment and feedback, we realized fairly early that many of these FQHCs, the providers don't know what are their screening rates, what are their peer screening rates, what are the screening rates of similar sized clinics and similar urban centers. So just getting them more information, more data. Um, provider reminder systems can be as simple as a pop-up in the electronic health record. All of these um, systems use slightly different health records, none are exactly the same. I think only one is using EPIC. So it really create, it, it, we have to recreate it basically with every health system. Um, this could also be as simple as a medical assistant flagging when a patient needs colorectal cancer screening. Doesn't have to be high tech. Patient reminder systems can be things like letters or birthday cards on their 50th birthday, hey, you're due for your colon cancer screening. Um, emails, postcards, phone calls. This is really where a, um, a navigator can be very helpful in calling people to have them come in to get screened. And then reducing structural barriers is things like having clinics that run after work hours or before work hours, weekend hours, having things like flu fit clinics, which is when you come in to get your flu shot, we're gonna talk to you about your fit card and distribute those at that time. Doing health fairs where we distribute fit clinics, fit cards, etc. So they have to choose one of those four, and then they can choose any of the supporting strategies. And I bolded the ones that every clinic chose. But I'll give you an example of small media in the next slide, but these are things like brochures, posters that you put up in the waiting room, things you leave in the exam room. Um, we, we made small media that we used as bus placards in the, in the neighborhood um, bus lines around the clinic that we were serving. Community clinical linkages is outreach to the primary population. Um, so speaking at church groups, going to community health fairs, that kind of thing. And also it's us facilitating the linkages between these primary care doctors and the specialty care doctors because part of the problem with these FQHCs is that they don't do colonoscopy in the FQHC, they don't do oncology care, they don't do surgery, so they have to find outside care for their patients. So we wanna help reduce those barriers. And then finally, Community clinical linkages can include community health workers, which are basically frontline public health workers, uh, chosen either by an organization or community to provide basic health and medical care, and they can be a, a vast resource for this population. Health information technology, every clinic identified that as a potential area for improvement for them in terms of making their um, electronic medical record work better. Every clinic is now has an EMR, but they're at different phases of rolling it out. Professional development, every clinic identified that they felt their providers could know more about colorectal cancer, and that's part of the work that I'm doing later this year, I'm going out and talking to each clinic about colorectal cancer screening. And then patient navigation, as I said. So a person whose sole job it is is to get that person through colon cancer screening or whatever additional testing is needed. 
So this is an example of small media that my group created. This was a bus placard we put up in Milwaukee, and we also ran it in their local newspaper. So again, addressing that digital divide, right? If you do an, a website with this beautiful ad on it, but nobody has access to a computer, it's not going to be highly effective. This um, gentleman was a patient at the clinic that we were working with. So we thought that was important for it to be a, a real person that many people would potentially know. So within each clinic, this is what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to find a colorectal cancer screening champion, which in most cases is either a manager or a physician, and then form a team around colorectal cancer screening. Because they are reporting to this UDS measure, many of them already sort of had it on the radar that they wanted to improve their colon cancer screening rates. We're then doing an assessment of how are they doing screening now? How do providers make referrals for colonoscopy? What do they do if there's a positive test? To just understand workflow, and then we're interviewing people about where do you think there's areas for improvement? How could we do better? What are, what are you perceiving as problem areas that need to be addressed? As part of that, we surveyed all of the providers, and I have that data later for you, too. Then this group selects the EBIs they'd like to try out. We then work with them to implement and evaluate it. So we're doing continuous evaluation of how this is going because we want to revise it if it's not being helpful. And then ongoing monitoring. We're meeting with them monthly. Over the last nine months, all of our partners have done all of these tasks, which we're delighted to tell you. This next slide is which um, clinic chose which EBI. It doesn't matter which EBI they chose. I just want you to see that every clinic looks a little bit different, right? So it's highly individualized and customized to each clinic operation, which we think is important. And then contrast that with the publicly available WCHQ data. Um, shout out to UW Health here for being the highest. 81.3%. Um, Aspirus being the lowest at 61.9% is still double what most of our FQHCs are. So we have a long way to go. Um, and we, you can see that patients um, in the FQHCs are not seeing the same benefit as patients who are accessing, for example, UW Health Services. So that takes me to our primary care provider survey. This was across all the health systems, uh, 62 providers. The bulk were physicians, the majority of which were family medicine. There was also a reasonable chunk of nurse practitioners and physician assistants represented. We asked them, how effective are these particular modalities for screening for colon cancer? I think there's two take-home points in this slide. One is that the vast majority uh, realized that colonoscopy is our gold standard and called it very effective for colon cancer screening, which is great. The more concerning uh, line is the bottom line there that about half of, of people surveyed felt that in-office GUIAC, so in-office dual card, was either very or somewhat effective. That is not a recommended screening strategy across any guidelines that I could find. So about half of those providers still were thinking that was an okay way to screen. Of those who felt the FIT testing was very effective, um, most said because of convenience, patients can do it at home on their own time. It doesn't require any prep or dietary modification, unlike WIAC based testing. It has reasonable sensitivity and specificity and has high compliance. We also asked the same questions of those who felt it was not effective, and interestingly, poor compliance <laughs> came up for them. Um, so, totally conflicting information there. Inconvenience, false positives, and false negatives. And we can talk when I'm done about you know, pros and cons for the FIT testing, but I still think that it's for a group where getting a colonoscopy involves potentially taking two days off work, one day to prep, one day to take the test, logistics and getting childcare figured out, getting a driver. Many of these people don't have access to transportation, losing wages, uh, getting to a larger health system that is usually not in the same community where you live. There's a lot of barriers there to get colon cancer screened, and then you throw on top of that a perception that the risk is not high, struggling with poverty, social stresses. You know, I believe the best colorectal cancer screening test is the one that gets done, and FIT testing is much more likely to be done in this population than colonoscopy. Agreeing that if we could do colonoscopy across the board, that would be ideal, but I think that's not very realistic. So we then asked these providers, what do you do for a positive fit? The majority referred for colonoscopy or referred to GI, which is the right answer. Um, but a, a moderate chunk said they would just repeat the test, which I don't think is usually the right answer. I think once you get a positive fit, you want to evaluate that with the definitive test. So again, we have an opportunity for improved um, education here. 
So other than continuing to roll out these EBBIs and work with these clinics and work out the kinks, what else are we doing? Well, we're doing the professional development for both CME and CEU for staff and providers. We're forming what's called a community of practice, which is peer-to-peer -peer support so they can share success stories, challenges, try to troubleshoot together. We're forming a community task force um, across Milwaukee to try to address these issues at the community level, which could include community-wide media campaigns around colorectal cancer screening, advocating for certain policy changes, that kind of thing. And then we are continuing to do this monitoring and evaluation, so these clinics are um, completing evaluation logs for us, implementation logs every month. We're doing annual provider surveys. We're doing the patient survey coming up in a couple months. Um, and then we're continuing to meet with them monthly to go through their data. And then I'm very happy to tell you that we are expanding this work to the Federally Qualified Health Center here in Madison, which is called Access Community Health Center. We're going to do a very, very similar um, project here in Madison, um, individualized to access his needs. That project includes collaborators Jen Weiss, who I see is here, <laughs> Liz Jacobs, and Nancy Pondy. And that is just getting rolling right now. So that was the bulk of my talk. My take home points that I want to make sure you, you leave with is that there is a significant racial disparity in colorectal cancer incidence, mortality, and outcome that is not based in true biological predisposition. That 50% of this disparity is due to lack of screening. That poverty makes you sick. And that public health efforts can be successful in improving screening rates, even in high need clinic setting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noel. Uh, that was really terrific. Uh, I don't know whether you all realize the Department of Medicine has a Twitter account, and maybe we can retweet the other retweet or something like that. I don't fully understand this. But in any case, I'll ask, I'll ask you to call on the audience, please, and, and also please repeat the question for the recording. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> So Milwaukee has a very innovative system of sharing the risk of uninsured and underinsured patients. We are trying to get that effort underway here in Madison, but basically they have formed a pool. And so it's whoever comes up next in that pool will take that patient. And in doing so, there's not one center that ends up taking on more patients. But yes, getting access to colectomy and uh, chemotherapy has not been an issue for our patients. About 3% of patients are positive within a one year span. So it's not a huge number of patients that we need to get through the system, but so far it has not been a barrier. Okay. <laughs> Even if you don't have questions, I'm curious for feedback, thoughts. Let me just ask, in terms of our locally, uh, the Access Community Health Center, not, not to publicly shame them because I'm sure mm -hmm. things will improve one way or the other, mm -hmm. how are we doing at the Access Center now? Yeah, they did not want us to publicly share that data. Um, they are doing better than some of the Milwaukee centers, but um, I, I would feel more comfortable sharing that once I had their permission. And, and also, in terms of the numbers you showed, mm -hmm. um, looking at the goals for the different centers, one had a goal of 80%, one right. had a goal of 25%. Right. Just look, reading between the lines, can we <laughs> presume that the, maybe the homeless center was the 25% or just less ambitious? Yeah, no, they, have a, they serve an even higher needs population. We work with them to set a goal that's hopefully achievable in five years. And you have to meet patients where they're at. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the community health workers, uh, so the question was, how do we use the patient surveys to inform our colorectal screening efforts? I think color, um, community health workers are an excellent way to do it. Navigators, also excellent. So in that pilot project that I did, we worked with a medical assistant who lived in the community. She would see people at the grocery store and say, hey, Larry, you haven't turned your card in. Um, you know, it was, <laughs> it was a really, really great system in, in meeting people where they're at. It's obviously partially education. We really want to understand things like flu fit, expanded hours, 
We think that most people really want to get screened and either they perceive their risk as low or there's just structural barriers that we need to address. But we don't think there's people that just will never be screened. So that's how we're using the data right now. Jen? So um, the one clinic that I had worked with where we rolled out patient navigators uh, was the only one that had a cancer-specific patient navigator, and there's multiple ones that are trying it out now. Yep, Dan? question was about how do we capture um, socioeconomic status determinants of health in the electronic health record and then how do we harness larger organizations like the AARP in helping us. Yeah, well the first one, I mean, I think, um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily reliant on the electronic health record as much as it's reliant on providers talking to their patients about background, where do you live, who lives with you, how do you get food, how do you pay for food. I think it's being aware of our own biases when we go in to meet with a patient that looks or is different than us. I think it's about asking patients about their understanding of their health and their wellness. What are their concerns? Asking about personal violence, exposure to violence. I think these are conversations that we don't often have but can really be helpful in that single patient provider dyad. And, uh, you know, in a larger system, Epic could do things. We could ask about income. We could ask about food desert. We could map their, you know, zip code onto that food desert map. But I, I think it really comes down to what are you going to do in that moment with the patient, not so much what is that computer going to tell you about the patient, because it ends up being just a repository that people don't look at. Um, now, the second question about AARP, I don't know. Uh, you know, many people in poverty have not had long-term successful employment, and so maybe they aren't on the AARP, because you can't R if you're not E, I guess. You can't retire if you're not employed. So um, I don't know if that's the right population or not. Um, certainly there are other community organizations that can be helpful too. And you saw that when we did that kickoff, all those different people that showed up to help us kick this off. There's a lot of interested parties, so. The question was, do, are the Triumph students involved in my project? Yep, Jack? Uh, increasing awareness to include cancer screening is about to change with the COVID scale of COVID where the screening of cancer patients and breast is another cancer screening that we are now undertaking. And it's up in the meeting with the centers and the Pacific Secretary to talk about the right yeah. way. We would have the ability to measure other screening rates. I think, I'm not sure that maps so much onto my projects as much as it maps onto these comprehensive medical homes as the right structure for this population. So if you have a medical home with a provider who knows you well, you're more likely to get the kind of preventive health care that you need. But we do have the capacity to look at those, like how did breast cancer screening improve?
Department of Medicine Book Club for evicted. Awesome. Yep. Um, I think that percentage is going down, but I don't know the exact percentage off the top of my head. The question was how many people are completely outside the health system. These federally qualified health centers are really meant to be the safety net health system. If you're uninsured, we can get you care through them. If you're, if you're homeless, we can get you care. But I don't know the exact percentage. I do know it went down under the Affordable Care Act, but I couldn't quote you the number. Okay. Nope, nope. I would say most of these FQHCs are referring straight for colonoscopy. And then uh, the colonoscopy has to be done outside of that FQHC, so one of the larger health systems within Milwaukee. So it requires the patient calling, setting up the appointment, going to pick up the go lightly, et cetera. So there's a lot of barriers for um, a patient. Uh, my personal belief is that FIT is a great test for this population. However, we wanted to empower each health system to make their own decisions around. I mean, they're the ones who know the patients. so. Um, it may look different in every health system. Yep, Rick. <laughs> Hi. So the comments were around the Indian um, Native community rolling out FID or FOBT as their first line testing and then using colonoscopy only for people with positive testing, which seems like a very rational and reasonable approach. And the second comment was around that rural health communities may see similar disparities, which I, I, I think is true too, Rick. I haven't dug that deep into the numbers. But, you know, we were asked to work with an urban community. I was born in Milwaukee. I love Milwaukee. I want Milwaukee to do well. So we picked Milwaukee. But uh, point well taken, we could have done this in multiple places. Yep, Bill. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's key. It's key, right? So when the provider looks different than the patient, the quality of the health care goes down, and that has to do with these biases that exist. So for us to provide great health care to black communities, we need more black doctors, black nurses, black MAs. That is a process that takes a pipeline. It takes many people. It, it's a long-term investment. But yes, that would be a very wonderful strategy. Um, and is a strategy that people are pursuing. Good, good point. Yes. Um, Jen, do you know that? So the question was, how is UW Health doing in regards to racial and ethnic disparities?
comment was people who are non-English speakers are half as likely to get colorectal screening in UW Health. We should all work to reduce our own bias. White doctors are not off the hook as well. You're welcome. <laughs> I got it on the recording. With, with that very important point, I, I want to thank Dr. Lacante for really an outstanding grand rounds. Thank you.